Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anna Makur, with you at B2B World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two important stories. The first is, is a reference to the political situation in the country, particularly, of course, that has happened with regards to the former Prime Minister Imran Khan and uh, him evading the arrest uh, back at his place in Lahore, uh, something, of course, that has been much talked about. There were a lot of supporters gathered outside uh, yet again uh, to uh, avoid this particular arrest. And uh, we also had statements coming in from the BTI leader, Shivji Thara, saying that the BTI chairman is not available. Uh, and uh, something, of course, which was uh, put under question after he addressed the party workers from the same place. Um, and because of that, there is a lot of discussions with regards to how this particular issue is going to now proceed. There are a number of cases that the PTI chairman is uh, currently uh, going through, uh, and uh, many of them, of course, are going ahead simultaneously. Uh, he has had uh, bills uh, from uh, various cases, but in the Zosha Khanna reference, uh, the court has upheld the non bailable arrest warrants. However, despite the police actually going to his residence in Lahore, uh, the PTI chairman was able to avoid arrest. Later speaking uh, to a press conference, the Interior Minister Rana Sanala also talked about how this is not the government's intent, nor uh, is the government's will to arrest the PTI chairman. In fact, the government is going to respect whatever the court decides, and it is up to the court to go ahead and proceed with whatever is uh, the legal standing now moving forward. He talked, of course, about the way uh, that uh, the PTI chairman's conduct is affecting the proceedings and then, of course, the economy and other relationships uh, that exist with Afghanistan and the rest of the country and the uh, spike in terrorist activities that we are currently facing. He also, of course, uh, talked about the many important aspects uh, of uh, the PTI chairman in the past as well. Uh, and uh, because of this, uh, we're going to be taking a look at what this means in terms of the very uh, many number of cases uh, that the PTI chairman is currently dealing with and how this is going to impact. There's also, of course, a development coming in from the former Chief Justice, Akhil Nassar, who has given a statement uh, with regards to uh, the PTI chairman asking for help in the cases uh, that he is undergoing and said that he denied any help and told him to respect the institutions, respect the judiciary and the law. And he also referred to uh, the previous verdict uh, uh, where the uh, PTI chairman was declared Sadiq and Mean and said that that was only in a single aspect that this was declared and not in the other aspects. And so uh, putting a question mark perhaps uh, there as well um, on the verdict, which was supposed to be uh, a particular badge of uh, the PTI chairman's credibility and character. So we're going to be taking a look at all of these developments and what this means in terms of the future. Uh, and of course, uh, the PTI's uh, leadership moving forward as well. We know that uh, the jail baro tariq uh, had uh, been abandoned by the PTI chairman following the Supreme Court's announcement regarding elections in KP and Punjab. And he was, uh, of course, uh, going to be starting his um, particular campaigns uh, from the weekend. The Interior Minister also spoke about how this is a decision coming in from the ECP. And if uh, the ECP puts a ban on rallies uh, on uh, the people going ahead and talking uh, ill of uh, people who are not involved in uh, many different references, and then, of course, uh, blaming or p uh, p uh, putting out fingers on someone's character, then of course the election can proceed and it's going to be really easy. But uh, without that, of course, uh, there still remains uncertainty as to what is going to happen. So that is going to be the focus of our first segment of the show today with regards to the current political situation. In the next one, we're going to be taking a look at the counterterrorism dialogue that has kicked off between the U.S. and Pakistan as part of uh, the, of course, uh, much-awaited uh, the enhancement of uh, the relationship and the strategic partnership between the U.S. and Pakistan, and particularly with regards to counterterrorism efforts. It's extremely important to see uh, what sort of a relationship this is going to take and proceed. This is, of course, something that still remains to be seen. But perhaps the two-day dialogue uh, is uh, something that is going to help us in this regard and is being taken uh, as a positive sign towards cooperation by the U.S. and uh, something uh, that uh, puts to bed uh, the speculations uh, regarding U.S. abandonment in the fight against terrorism for Pakistan. Earlier also uh, in the recent briefings by the U.S. State Department, we also heard statements coming in that the threat or by the PTP to Pakistan could be possibly a threat to the U.S. in the future as well. But what this mean means on ground and what sort of cooperation can possibly exist now between the two countries is something that we'll try and understand in the show today. 
Thursday. So for this and more, as always, in the studios, I've been joined by a senior analyst, Saruf Gaddafi. We've also been joined by our guests online for our first segment. We've been joined by Mr. Zana Makbul Ahmed, who's a senator at the MLN. And we've also been joined by Barrister Safi Ghori, who's a legal expert and also political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being a part of the discussion today. Um, and let me start with you, Barrister Safi. The discussions, of course, around the PTI chairman's cases are many, and it's perhaps hard to keep track of the number of cases and the number of proceedings that have been going on. Um, and because of that, uh, it, it puts to question a lot of the uh, aspects of certain proceedings that uh, the PTI chairman has to undergo. We, of course, know that one of the things that was cited by uh, Mr. Fawad Chaudhary also is that uh, the uh, PTI chairman has protected bail from the Islamabad High Court, but it seems that that's from a different case and not the Tosha Khana reference case. Could you also help us understand what this means uh, legally in terms of where the PTI chairman now stands, considering that the Islamabad police went to arrest him, but he evaded arrest? and that this bail was not a uh, part of the Tosha Khana reference. So what this means now in legal terms. Thank you so much, Sana. And the law in this particular scenario is extremely clear. I think, once again, what we see is PTI trying to subvert the law, trying to misinform the public as to what the law is. Section 75, subsection 2 of the Code of Criminal Procedure very clearly states that a warrant of arrest can only be cancelled by the court of its issuance, that is the court that issued those arrest warrants, or it has to be executed. There are only two possibilities this could happen. Now, instead, what we see is PTI workers creating tremendous hue and cry, talking about how there's been tremendous injustice. And we also saw PTI lawyers go up to the Lahore High Court and face their bail applications. There is no bail in this case. There is, a, it's a simple arrest warrant. The warrant states that he must appear before the court. And if he does not appear before the court, then he may be arrested. So to try and apply for a bail is absolutely incorrect and it is against the law. There is one thing that he could get, which is a transitory bail in which he goes before the Lahore High Court, states that he needs time to appear before the Islamabad court, which has issued the arrest warrants, state why he needs that extra time. And if he's given a transitory bail, then he may have to then he may have sufficient time to await arrest, go to Islamabad and present himself there. Now, this is something that has applied in every legal state. We have seen this happening to President Zardari, former President Zardari. We have seen it happening to former President Nawaz Sharif, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. So, all of these, all of these leaders of the country had applied for transitory bails, went before the issuing courts, tried to get the warrants cancelled. In some cases, the warrant was not cancelled because sufficient cause was not presented and they were arrested. Or otherwise, it is the court's discretion to cancel the arrest warrant. And in this case, the court would have. But it is Imran Khan who continues to evade. On the one hand, he talks about how there is justice in Pakistan, about how there are multiple examples of European countries where the court states something, everybody is equal before them. He keeps giving examples of ministers and prime ministers of the United Kingdom and how they are submitting themselves for the rule of law. And then when it comes to himself, he runs up to the neighbor's house to try and evade arrest. And this is just hilarious at this stage. And I don't know what the PTI strategy is and how this is helping on to anyone at all. In fact, to add fire to the fuel, he actively stated that the court was correct, but it was correct in summoning all of us they were corrupt and he is not. And add to that also the fact that he publicly that he now wants a massive public gathering on Wednesday to try and stop this from happening. This is a crime, obstruction of justice. So all I see is things getting I just see that you know he's he's making these institutions PTI workers are buying into it. Many members of the public think that perhaps some injustice going on. I feel that that's just sad. This is not the case when other leaders were getting arrested. No. At least subvert the law to this extent. Right. All right. Um, Barrister Safi, we, we'll come back to you and I'll ask perhaps a little bit more explanation at the end because we, we uh, were experiencing some trouble with the audio. But I'll, I'll come back to that as well. And let me also include in the discussion Rana Saab. Uh, in terms of what the Interior Minister has said, Rana Saab, we uh, have seen that the sentiment from the government is that they are uh, 
uh, going to let the, uh, uh, the proceedings as they are and they are not interested in the arrest and they have made it very clear that there is no political angle to this. Of course, this is something that is being played by the political leadership of the PTI a lot in terms of how the cases are proceeding. But it seems much as uh, Barrister Safi was also po pointing out, much that is, is uh, uh, being a cause of trouble is at the hands of the PTI chairman and the party leadership themselves and how they are responding to the legal cases. But despite that, we see that there is perhaps still a lot of the things that the PTI chairman has been able to get away with in the past, perhaps still is, uh, in terms of how this all is proceeding. What do you think about the way that now when we see moving forward so many times uh, the PTI chairman has been able to avoid court appearances, that that, has, uh, that, that is going to uh, eventually impact or affect the way the court proceedings will now move forward? Uh, irrespective of what has happened, I want to indicate uh, the danger and the risk of lives of the people, the supporters. This uh, uh, situation, Yoni Gada is, uh, as per his uh, understanding, multitudes of people around him, everywhere, around his house, and uh, once he moves outside, goes to different uh, premises of courts. It's extremely dangerous. He should realize that it's, uh, this crowd is vulnerable, and any uh, rugby element or uh, saboteurs or uh, the, the terrorists, they can uh, penetrate into the crowd and create a great situation, dangerous situation. They should realize and this game should be over. Time and again it's being repeated, the gimmicks are being repeated. And I personally think the government must come down with a heavy hand and tell them to behave and wherever he goes, they should give the list of the people and uh, one, two, three, four, five who will get into the premises or the courtroom. Nobody else should be allowed to get in. And there should not be crowds or uh, gatherings uh, outside the court because sometimes it will entail a lot of uh, uh, great situation. This is, as, as a student of this science of uh, uh, law and order, I, I really, for sure, I feel they should revise their policy. As far as uh, the, the, the massive uh, extraordinary relief which is being extended by the Honorable Courts to him, that should stop forthwith. All right, the government has said that they don't want to arrest him. It was only for the compliance of the non valuable warrant of uh, the accused he was supposed to appear. So instead of uh, uh, applying for protective bail, or as my friend was telling, transitory bail, he is, it tried to escape the situation, which uh, created uh, bitter feelings. And I think uh, now he has to finally appear uh, before all the courts. He can't escape this. Therefore, this drama should be over. It's already uh, causing a lot of destabilization unnecessarily. This, this storm in the teacup must stop because it's not going to give any results to him. But I understand his ga game is not as uh, impressive as it used to be. No, he should understand and he should put his feet on ground instead of just uh, living in a world of hallucination. This is what my suggestion is. All right. Um, uh, Farooq, what do you make of uh, the statement coming in from the former Chief Justice as well? We keep on talking about how there is uh, relief perhaps given to the PTI chairman from the courts and whatnot. And now we have a former Chief Justice making a claim that the PTI chairman has asked for help. Uh, what does that mean in terms of uh, the value that that has uh, in the way that the uh, proceedings have gone or what the PTI chairman uh, is asking for? Right, uh, Sana, before I actually talk about former Chief Justice, let me also talk about PTI itself. Mm. Uh, mm. Because uh, for a party that was conceived as Tariq and Saf, uh, that is Movement for Justice, and whose leader Imran Khan Sabshir never uh, forgets to remind us that societies that were uh, destroyed had two systems of justice, one for the rich, one for the poor. 
And this time it seems that uh, uh, in his own uh, sphere of influence, there are three levels or uh, standards of justice. One for the ordinary mortals like you and I, the second one for the affluent because they have been, uh, this is an elitist society, mm -hmm. and the third one for Imran Khan himself. Uh, there are two ways uh, to avoid the cases. First, uh, whenever there is any, any case against him, he actually appears on television, decries it, and says that he is being victimized, and then he comes up with a very elaborate conspiracy theory. Uh, as we proceed further, I'm going to actually offer a counter conspiracy theory as well. Okay. Uh, but at this moment, uh, regarding the way he is handled, uh, one, Conspir through conspiracy theories and his media influence, he tries to undermine the rule of law. And that is not all. Whenever there is uh, a peshi in front of a court, or whenever he is uh, uh, either summoned, or then there, uh, like the recent episode, uh, forces are sent to actually arraign him, uh, what happens? He uses mob as human shield. And that again uh, shows you how much he regards the rule of law. Uh, for mortals like you and I, uh, we were told that if you are driving on the road and the authorities stop you, first thing you have to do is cooperate with them. Then, of course, uh, uh, if there is any kind of violation of your side, you can actually escalate it to the concerned authorities. But first, you cooperate. That doesn't seem to be happening in Imran Khan Saab's case. I don't understand how he actually... Um, uh, sees those optics uh, playing out because I think that this is horrible. Horrible. Uh, these are horrible optics and it is going to eventually undermine the whole concept of Tariq and Saaf or movement of justice. Mm. Having said that, now the former Chief Justice. Mm. I'm glad that he was the first uh, to speak uh, because I think the kind of reports we keep on hearing and then we keep on hearing that there are tapes also um, uh, he, uh, uh, about him actually using his, his influence to lobby for Imran Khan uh, with that kind of evidence or speculation in the e air while he has spoken and his first reaction is essentially denial. But uh, what, uh, what can we do with his words which were actually stated in, in presence of many people where he said that I'm all out for Imran Khan. Um, and regarding his past uh, judgment, uh, regarding uh, Sadiq Amin being mm. only on one aspect or regarding one aspect, say is something very interesting. What okay. are we playing at? Are we playing a game of Fifty Shades? Uh, because uh, Sadiq, uh, either you are Sadiq Amin or you are not. So if you say that he was uh, Sadiq Amin in on this aspect, aspect and not true. in that one, yes. then you have lost the plot. Uh, I'm sorry, he says that he is going to, now he's not going to talk to the media and he's going to write a book that will be published posthumously. My problem is I want to see that book because I think that there are going to be truckloads of confessions there. Mm, absolutely, and that's uh, important and of course uh, we, we need that sooner rather than later as well in terms of how we're going to proceed. But Barrister Safi, the, the understanding here of course when we take a look at all of these cases and, and the way that the, the PTI chairman uh, has been dealt with or the way the, the, in the perception exists uh, in terms of the way the court proceedings are going forward, um, why is it that when, when we have uh, uh, such uh, obvious answers to some of the ways uh, that, that the, the, the conduct has been by the PTI chairman, that there aren't as obvious uh, uh, decisions being taken in terms of uh, the consequences of it? I understand that the, the we, we talk about the relief, but in terms of actual measures, it seems that a lot of that uh, is, al is also being uh, played as uh, perhaps something that needs more clarity. Is, is that the case, that there, there needs to be more clarity, or is it, is it just that it's, it's an obvious thing, but it's not happening? I think uh, it's a very good question, Sana, and the answer is quite obvious. We know what the law is. The law is not being implemented because of certain fear factors that the courts have. Um, I think here's what's happening right now. This is just my own perception of, of the matter. This is not what the law is. The courts are responsible at least partly for the law and order situation in the country. And nobody wants to think that they would be responsible for causing mass disruption within the country. And there is, a, there is an impression that Imran Khan has given and the impression is that if something were to happen to him, that would be the red line for the party workers. And 
the party workers would go all out. They would maybe turn into a massive mob. They would start burning things. And PTI gives off that very violent vibe. People, people continue to think that PTI can turn into a very violent party. Like we have seen in the past some other political parties. Now, this may or may not happen. It's a, it's a guess. But I think a lot of the judges are fearful of being the ones who would be responsible for causing such an event to happen and but, so this is what this is what it could is that even, but could that even be a guiding factor in terms of legal proceedings not at all not at all of course not but judges are humans and just like you and i would be fearful of the kind of legacy that we are leaving behind what the rest of our family would think of us what everybody else would blame us for so I think judges too, in the same manner, continue to think that if they do not uh, are, or are not responsible for something that could cause a public outrage, they would continue to preserve good legacy. So it's just cowardice really at the end of the day. Because the law is, the law is to be applied equally to everyone. It's very clear, as Mitafi Saab just said, it's not being applied to PTI. So if it's not being applied to PTI, there are other reasons. And those are societal and social reasons, not legal reasons. All right. Um, Rana Saab, if, if that's the case, when, when, when we take a look at the consequences and perhaps the potential violence that can exist or the kind of ruckus that can be created, which the PTI chairman keeps pointing towards, especially from his party workers in case anything happens to him, is that something that the government is even considering or is fearful of, um, uh, even if we don't take the courts into account, in terms of the way that uh, we have seen since his ouster, the kind of statements and the kind of actions that have been taken, we keep on hearing, even you have repeatedly said that there needs to be consequence, but there hasn't been still uh, any action taken, and it seems that this is, this is, uh, uh, this is something that is being ignored uh, and uh, uh, is uh, letting it take its course by the government and not something that's actively being uh, uh, investigated or taken action against. Uh, yes, it's absolutely correct observation. There's a lot of reluctance and uh, inhibition in proceeding against him. Proceeding against him according to law, both is in, in his interest for his uh, security as far uh, as, far as uh, his uh, threat uh, to his whatever he thinks is, it, it will be very, very useful for him as well. And that latent fear would be over if he properly proceeded against. Number two, the role of the courts. Courts should not think on these lines that their action will be will be entailing these repercussions. That is not courts, baby. Courts will have to act strictly according to law, and they should not uh, uh, be giving uh, concession on every issue. Number three is the government. Government must, put, they should put it, their foot down and they should enforce law effectively and uh, meaningfully because this double-mindedness is going to be uh, disastrous for the country finally. They should uh, uh, clinch this situation effectively right today. But uh, this has uh, uh, Professor Ronald, Mr. Padafi um, analyzed the conduct of an honorable judge uh, saying uh, Sadek and I mean, there is no word of Sadek in the Constitution. They really uh, try to m make it more ornamental, Sadek and I mean. I may uh, go to one episode in one half, half a minute, less than half a minute. Uh, Mr. Altaf Gaur writes in his book that he learned that Justice Munir uh, is not well, he is severely ill. He traveled all the way from, he says, from Pindi to Lahore, and his house was behind the uh, uh, Civil Service Academy. He said that I, he went to his house, sought the permission. They, they said the judge is not feeling well, he is in the bed. Okay, he has per given the permission to go to him. He went to him. The first answer he, uh, the first question he put to Zab Gohar, Mr. Uh, Justice uh, uh, Munir Al Zab, uh, Okay, everything, maybe I don't know, but I am repenting over what has been done uh, with uh, the Malvi Tumizuddin case. What can be done at this stage? al God said, you pray to God forgiveness. There is no other solution to the problem. 
and the Honorable Judge with that name, unfortunately, passed away after three days. So this is the lesson for all the Honorable Judges. They have the role to play uh, for justice and fair play in the country, and they, they must strictly adhere to the ethics and morality of justice. And then there will not be any repentance. Honorable Judge say, after my death, there will be uh, what is not fair to him? He should come forward. If he has done something wrong, he should go for confessions, because confession will purge him. And uh, why to uh, keep everything to his chest now, even now at this stage? And everything will be uh, published after his death. What does it mean? For God's sake, have a heart. Come forward before the people. That will help you in, uh, in cathartic effect on your, uh, on your mind and body. He is in pain, looks to be, because he is repenting what he has done. So let's not do such things for which we have to repent afterwards. Absolutely. And Rana Sahib, perhaps that's something not restricted to just to judges and this kind of account accountability that perhaps should exist to um, all of us and uh, all of the uh, political decision makers and leaders as well in terms of the actions that they're taking. But Farooq, I also want to understand that the, uh, when we take a look at the issue of uh, consequence in terms of the uh, PTI and its workers, uh, in the past we've seen that perhaps the kind of uh, street power that existed hasn't been there and we of course see a large number of people at the residence uh, uh, trying to uh, prevent the arrest of the PTI chairman but really in terms of an actual consequence do you think that th this is really something that uh, is a consideration in terms of uh, if, if something has had to happen or if, if, the, uh, if the courts uh, uh, proceedings go against the PTI chairman that there will be a, a, a national level uh, problem that the government will have to face? Right, uh, Sarah, first a word that actually comes uh, is attached uh, to consequences. What exactly is it? Accountability, right? Uh, and uh, amazingly, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari actually brings up something very fascinating uh, he did in one of his speeches, that why is it that the biggest champions of uh, National Accountability Bureau are the people who fall outside this purview, judges and retired army officers, right? Why is it that they keep on championing it? And I think it to totally makes sense. If you are not facing consequences of the brunt of that body, then you can actually go, uh, go on uh, building up conspiracy theories and p pumping in as much air into this facade as possible. Mm. Having, s having said that, let me, um, uh, regarding this human shield issue, um, of course, uh, when it comes to courts, there must be some realization that uh, amal, uh, or disruption of law and order can also take place and that can, um, in retrospect, reflect negatively. But uh, having said that, well, I mean, in the past also, there were umpteen people who used the same tactic, but there the courts uh, kept, uh, were very ad uh, really adamant that these things, uh, the rule of uh, uh, law should carry, right? And it has been happening in the past many a times when the uh, police kept on saying that there is going to be this kind of consequences, but the courts were insisting that you actually take action. Uh, I can go into examples as well, but uh, it seems that they, uh, the system still is the treating Imran Khan as a ladla or the mm. as the favored son, uh, because repeatedly we have seen that he gets concessions where none could even expect to get it. And then we saw this matter of a special suo moto where the end half the bench was actually crying out loud that uh, uh, things shouldn't be done this way. But the concessions were given and the way, uh, you know, relief, uh, remember, when it came to the office of governor of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, you know, it was uh, the bench actually stated or the majority did whatever passes for majority that uh, 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 the governor has erred and actually outstepped his bounds. But mm. no similar language was present for the president whose lawyer had actually confessed on, on record that in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa's case, he had actually erred and actually violated his mandate. So there seems to be some kind of uh, special treatment meted out in Ranhantap. I don't know what exactly the dynamics are, mm. but uh, regarding conspiracy theories also, uh, can I get uh, one minute to yeah, actually yeah. give you uh, uh, one very amazing thing that I heard today, and this comes from certain quarters of uh, powerful, influential people in the country, 
that Pakistan is uh, uh, in the middle of two clashing world orders, right? One is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Biden order, that is a prevalent order since 1945. And the other one is Trumpian world order, which was dominated by Putin uh, and uh, Narendra Modi's influence. So what exactly is happening, and this actually is a reference to the way IMF is treating you, because IMF uh, astoundingly keeps on asking for you for impossibly you know, unpopular policies, and even then it is still dragging its feet. So the argument was that, of course, the at this moment it is not the board which is doing it, right? Uh, it is the bureaucracy of IMF which is dragging its feet because uh, before uh, you actually present your case before a board, there has to be a staff level agreement. And in that, they actually remind you that the current team, or at least the head of the current team, uh, that is Deputy MD, is uh, a holdover from Trump Trumpian era mm. when uh, uh, the chief economist had immediately resigned for some unknown reason. And an Indian uh, a lady of Indian origin, Geeta Gopinath, was actually first made chief economist. And then now she is the deputy MD. And uh, but she is actually controlling the outcome and uh, atmospherics. Now the question is, uh, is India playing any role? India has nothing to gain from the rise of Imran Khan. Mm. So who else might, uh, might be doing it? You know, uh, remember America itself does not gain anything out of that kind of a situation. And it is doubling down on cooperating with Pakistan. Your next topic is one of the yes. uh, proofs that that is so. So who might it be? The holdovers of Putin, Trumpian, <laughs> uh, I'm told, uh, yes. world order, that actually want people who were friendly towards Trump and Putin to rise again. And that's why this kind of concessions are being asked. And because uh, it is impossible, IMF will keep on dragging its feet. And b if it does, this government will start actually collapsing. And right. this is the hope. Right. Uh, Barrister Safi, you can add to that as well. But I also have a quick question since we, ha we are short on time in terms of the uh, request or the demand by the BTR chairman of the Tosha Khanna reference case to be uh, televised as well. Uh, and that, that is something that is important to the case and for the facts to come out. Why is it that this, uh, this uh, particular demand exists in this case? And then uh, whether or not this is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that can, can be a norm in terms of uh, the cases to go forward? Because, of course, uh, the, the proceedings are as they are, and uh, is this something that is just being demanded to uh, get some political mileage out of it, or do you think that the, the case necessitates it? Uh, great question, Sana, and um, Imran Khan's demand, though illegal, and though uh, something that the Pakistan Constitution or the Sana provide for, is something that I actually support. I do believe that court cases should be televised. This has been a debate with the Supreme Court and also the Supreme Court in the Congress. I mean, again, and not just in Pakistan, the world over. Pakistan and the courts thought that, you know, televising debates, televising live cases would subject them to uh, contempt because people start trying to place pressure on judges and so they removed all of this. But there are many cases which are public. Probably watch a lot of U.S. trials that go publicly live, and everybody sees how how the judges react. So, frankly, I am of the opinion that in this day and age, it is a good idea to televise cases, and if this can lead to greater justice, so be it. I don't see any need for that. If you recollect, there was a time when they put up cameras in Rawalpindi district courts, and during that time, it is said that the disposal of cases went up, and the overall demeanor of uh, um, the plaintiffs and the defendants, and everything improved substantially, and there was also a lot of live evidence whenever someone misbehaved with the judges. So it's something that can actually assist the courts rather than hamper them. So here's, here's one place where I'm actually agree with him. Good idea. All right. All right. Uh, Rana Saab, uh, considering uh, the fact that uh, the elections are also uh, going to be held in KP and Punjab and the uh, former uh, prime minister is, uh, of course, uh, talking about his campaigns and then he's dealing with all of these cases. He had a jail bureau, uh, Tariq, which he abandoned in, in light of the Supreme Court's ruling. Um, there is a lot of movement in terms of what the PTI wants uh, to see uh, in, in the next coming days and months. But what is the, is, is the way forward for the current political setup and the government as well?
uh, uh, in line with, with the way that these cases are going ahead and uh, what the PTI then claims because there is uh, what uh, we were talking about in terms of the um, uh, truckers or the mass movement that can take place, there is the legal proceedings and then there is a very volatile economic situation as well. So what do you see in terms of what is going to be uh, uh, happening now in KP and Punjab in light of these legal cases? Pranatap, can you hear me? Pranatap, are you oh, Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I don't know, uh, yes, uh, I don't know what's going to happen because a situation is very unpredictable. You might have uh, listened to Mohammed Fazlur Rahman and other legal leaders as well on elections. So there is still uh, a syndrome of uh, uncertainty about the elections. The picture is not clear despite the Supreme Court uh, verdict to which people have different opinion. The most uh, important issue is uh, the provision of resources. Once uh, the finances are not available, uh, so to say, and uh, the personnel, as we understand, uh, are not being provided, they can't afford to provide the requisite for personnel. Identically, there's no clearance about uh, the provision of uh, returning officers. So there are not many hazards so far. So one can't say what's going to happen, but all the same, if it happened, the, the uh, government, uh, especially uh, PML, and they are ready, they have announced time and again, they'll get into the election arena, their movement, uh, uh, rather uh, mobilization movement is already there. They are uh, holding the convention, meeting the people, uh, talking to the people, getting across to the people. Then people will decide what happens uh, uh, in these two provinces. All the same, there is a very strong opinion in the in the sensible cadre of uh, all the masses are sensible, but little more aware uh, cadres they say there should be elections both simultaneously of national assemblies and provincial assemblies. If only provincial assembly elections are uh, held, that will be injurious for the peace of the country. So all these situations are in the melting pot and. Still, the, the, the final decision has to come up. Absolutely, there is a lot of uncertainty. Thank you very much, Rana Saab, and thank you, Barrister Safi, for joining us. Yes, Maru. Uh, right. Uh, regarding the uh, conduct of elections also, uh, it is said that there is this matter of Lagla playing out. Uh, one example is that uh, wherever Imran Khan Saab wants to actually contest the elections, right. there he gets whatever he wants, but there are places where he does not want to. Uh, for example, in Rajanpur, there was an election but the places where he resigned, Imran Khan Saab say, keeps saying that his party is very popular and if uh, elections are held anywhere, he will return to power. Okay. Then why is it that his resignations are, uh, he went for a stay on those resignations and because of that, there is no election there. Had there been an election, we would have known that in urban centers where they have tendered resignation, whether he's going to actually return uh, to be returned to office or not, they could have easily gone through the process and then entered the assembly, right. but they did not. Th so the system is conceding, and if that is so, there is some lobbying going on behind the scenes. Right, and something, of course, that we need to consider. Now, of course, uh, there is a lot that is going on in Pakistan besides uh, what is happening in terms of the political arena as well. And, of course, a huge concern. There is the economic situation, but there's also the surge in terrorist activities in the country, which Pakistan has been dealing with for quite some time, particularly since uh, the Afghan Taliban regime took control in Afghanistan and then, of course, the end of the ceasefire, the TPP. The U.S. cooperation is something that we have been looking forward to. We have the dialogue on counterterrorism that is beginning today. And Farooq, this is important in terms of whether or not we're going to be seeing a restart of the previous strategic cooperation on counterterrorism. The dialogue perhaps may be a welcome step, but what do you foresee in terms of uh, the scale at which we can see this moving forward? Because there are conflicting uh, opinions regarding what the U.S. considers uh, the TTB to be, especially in terms of a threat to the U.S. Right. Uh, I think uh, the U.S. stance is very clear regarding TTP. Uh, they also have included it in the list of proscribed organizations. Mm -hmm. Many of its leaders were on the list of most wanted terrorists. That is not all. Some of the uh, worst terrorists, uh, like Hakim Allah Masood, were killed 
by uh, the American drones, not by Pakistani drones or Pakistani uh, activities against fi uh, in the fight against terrorism. So we are of the same mind. Remember that ISKP uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a very uh, thought to be a very uh, important uh, uh, concern for the U.S. And ISKP, uh, uh, Islamic State for Khorasan Province, is essentially a B team in one way or the other of CDP that whosoever actually is uh, uh, decides to desert it or thinks that TPP is not hard enough, they regroup and they join ISKP. Mm. So the U.S. also is concerned about it. And very interestingly, there's another dynamic, Sana, that whenever there is a terrorist attack inside Pakistan and TPP uh, is pressured by Afghan Taliban not to take uh, responsibility or oblique uh, uh, credit for that kind of terrorist attack, then within days or within hours, ISKP steps up the mm. plate and actually uh, starts taking credit for that. Why would that be? That, uh, there seems to be some pantomime horse-like uh, uh, you know, attitude of these uh, coalition of terrorist organizations that are somehow aligned with Afghan Taliban as well. And that's why the concern is that uh, if you, uh, these activities are not stopped, then there's going to be some kind of blowback that might actually exceed Pakistan or Afghanistan for that matter. Okay. And recently when our leadership went there uh, and uh, uh, our defense minister and other leaders, the word has it that we, uh, Pakistan actually demanded that some things should be done regarding TPP and Afghan Taliban actually demanded money to relocate them inside Afghanistan so that they don't actually create problem on your borders. And amazingly, so um, uh, not only you are going to be attacked and we are not going to do anything about it, but Fractured also pay us support, uh, yeah. the upkeep for the people yeah. who are attacking you as well. Uh, regarding Pakistan and the U.S. Uh, relationship and cooperation, the great thing at this moment is that while nobody is calling it uh, strategic dialogue, mm. but it seems that all those components that were there uh, many years ago, they are back. Um, and uh, it is important to remember that there is the ongoing cooperation on Pakistan-Afghan border management. And uh, recently when the U.S. military delegation actually came to Pakistan, they were taken to the border and shown how it is managed because that is a concern. Pakistan keeps on fencing the border and Afghan Taliban keep on dismantling it. So uh, whatever the concerns are at this moment, TPP and ISKP both are at the top of the list of both Pakistan and the uh, US uh, uh, list of priorities to handle. And then Afghan Taliban are not far behind right. because Afghan Taliban don't seem to be playing ball either with Pakistan or hmm. the US. Right, but in, in terms of uh, what this cooperation can look like, do you see any active involvement by the U.S., particularly in terms of our defense or military capabilities in the fight against terrorism within Pakistan? Right, uh, Sana, there are many, many uh, you know, moving parts to this question. Okay. One is, of course, uh, the cooperation between the U.S. and Pakistan that has been going on for quite some time. There was uh, a momentary, uh, you know, mor moratorium on that during Trump administration's time when um, he also tweeted some uh, disparaging uh, tweet against Pakistan. And Nikki Haley was really taking credit for that kind of an attitude. But mm -hmm. after that, we have seen that there is a thaw between uh, the U.S. and Pakistan, and the military cooperation has resumed. Uh, but having said that, remember that Pakistan is also in a very reactionary part of the world. So every cooperation today, actually, uh, many senators have spoken out uh, demanding the uh, uh, Prime Minister to speak on the joint uh, floor of the Parliament uh, to address the concerns, A, about Pakistan needs, as if they are under any concern, you know, any right. pressure yeah. at all. Uh, and secondly, also to actually take uh, into cogni uh, cognizance uh, whether um, confidence, whether there is any imperialist agreement between Pakistan and the U.S. to undermine China. I, I mean, come on. Uh, but this is the state of paranoia in the yeah. air. I uh, earlier actually gave you example of one conspiracy theory. This is the second one. So these things are there, but I'm sure that the U.S. understands how we work. So there's not going to be any 
demand that Pakistan should actually provide any bases or something of that sort. Mm. But over the horizon cooperation between Pakistan and uh, the U.S., uh, although Pakistan says there's none, and Afghan Taliban keep on insisting that Amal Zawahiri was killed because of this cooperation, right. I would advocate that there should be cooperation of this sort. Because okay. uh, what are Af Afghan Taliban doing at this moment? While they don't actually show any uh, direct compassion towards New Delhi, but uh, if you are helping people who are undermining us, you are helping our enemies. Right, of course. And this is something that we definitely will uh, need to encounter and factor in in the discussion as we move forward. But thank you, Faro, for, uh, for, for this as well. And of course, in terms of how we proceed, particularly with the U.S. and the fight against terrorism, is also going to largely depend on what uh, we prioritize and what we see as important and what sort of factors uh, and uh, decisions that we take at home as well. That's all that we have from the debate. I will see you with more news tomorrow.